Welcome to Concordia Theological Seminary and our lectionary podcast. For this proper six of series B, we're going to be focusing on the Old Testament text for the day. That would be from the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 17, verses 22 to 24. It's really short, three verses. Quite interesting, however, in the larger context of chapter 17. Our chapter here uh, begins with a riddle or an allegory, and that's introduced by the phrase, the word of Yahweh came to me. And that'll get repeated then here as we get to verse 11 in the text, not in our text, but in the chapter, uh, which begins the second major portion of this chapter, which is the part that um, our pericope is in. And as we go through these verses, it's interesting and important to see them in the larger context of the allegory in the opening portion of chapter 7. So I'd invite you to um, have your text, uh, well, keep your eye on that part of the text as well. You'll begin to notice very similar vocabulary, very similar uh, things set up that the allegory matches with our verses here. Uh, obviously not accidentally either. So Horace Hummel, a great Old Testament guy, uh, he wrote a, a great commentary on Ezekiel and the Concordia uh, commentary series. I recommend that, and I'll be referring to him off and on in here because he's, he's done some amazing work here, and I wouldn't want to pass that up. So he does something kind of interesting, though, that not a lot of people do, which is somewhat surprising, but he points to these three verses as a messianic prophecy. You don't see that very often in other commentaries. Uh, you don't hear that very often. Uh, and the church usage really hasn't indicated it that much either. Uh, but I would argue, I would join him in arguing for that messianic character, certainly, of this pericope. And apart from the fact that I'd contend that all of Scripture, old and new, has a messianic character, uh, there is also, though, um, other aspects of this verse that help us to see that character even more clearly than we might at first think as we'll look at it. And the first aspect to consider then is um, Ezekiel's use of horticultural expressions. Uh, let me walk you through that because the, we have the sprig, we'll talk about a cedar, branches, all these sort of things, which should bring to mind some rather famous, uh, better known passages of the Old Testament, certainly, uh, which all end up with eschatological climax to them, the climax of the line of David. So, um, and of course, that's Jesus. I, maybe I don't have to say that, but Isaiah for instance, he's Isaiah 11, 1, one of those famous uh, verses, uh, the sprout that comes out of the stump of Jesse. That's a very obvious and famous messianic uh, prophecy. We have Jeremiah talking about the righteous branch, again, a reference to the one who will come to Christ. Uh, that in chapter 23, and we also see some of that language in chapter 33 of Jeremiah. We also see earlier usages of root in, uh, in these chapters, also that in the chapter 11 in Isaiah again. Uh, and then if you go to uh, Isaiah 53, and this uh, verse 2 describing, describing the suffering servant, you also pick up this idea of root and uh, that kind of imagery, the dry tree and all of this sort of thing. Again, a very obvious messianic uh, portion of scripture, I mean, that, that really stands out that way. And notice again, they all use these horticultural expressions in referencing these. And, and I would argue, of course, you see the culmination or the complete fruition or fulfillment of that in Revelation 22, when we see the talk of the new heavens, um, where the tree of life is bearing fruit, and obviously it's in the courts of heaven itself. So these uh, horticultural expressions are very, very interesting, very common, and especially very, you'll notice they're very eschatological nature. 
So uh, it's something that we don't always talk about, at least I haven't heard talked about that much. Uh, Hummel will point to it. I think it's very, very fascinating. There's another theme and motif, which we're probably more familiar with, that's contained, that contains Messianic hope here in our, our short passages. Laid out in the verses, I have it in 23 and 24, I believe, but these, uh, the mountain motif, the high and lofty mountain, verse 22, excuse me, and then the mountain height of Israel in verse 23, they should remind us of Calvary and of the Temple Mount, Mount Zion, uh, as we go into the New Testament, the life of Christ. But also point us to that eschatological mountain of Isaiah 25, where, where God will call all nations to his holy mountain, where he has prepared uh, a rich feast, a banquet. Uh, of course, this is a reference to the wedding feast of the Lamb and His kingdom. So again, you see these, these um, motifs, these, these uh, expressions are very messianic in other places in Scripture, and they kind of help us to see the messianic uh, character here in these three verses. So um, I actually would think it would be hard to understand these verses any other way than messi in a messianic way. Uh, again, a thanks to Horace Hummel, and his Ezekiel commentary, uh, this we, I used uh, volume 1. He goes through verse, chapters 1 to 20 in first volume and the rest in a second volume. Very helpful. Uh, I would certainly think you should have that in your library, especially, uh, yeah, it just is one of the best I've ever seen on Ezekiel. So as we go to um, verse 22 then, You notice a redundancy here with the, the ani, uh, where God says, ani, when it was already said, I. So the, you see this, this focus, this redundancy is something like, I, even I, or I will surely, you know, um, the emphasis is upon this is what God will do. I, even I, will do it. Okay, that, and I think that's very uh, significant as we, as we look at this, that God is, is really laying out who's the doer. We're going to run into some other things in here where he's, God's going to make it very clear who's in charge, who's doing stuff, who's affecting things, causing things. Uh, so nobody will have any question no doubt in their mind about it. Uh, we also see a lot of, there's going to be a lot of ver words in here that we're not real familiar with, and I'll point out uh, several of them. You know, Ezekiel is notorious for having a whole different vocabulary, uh, perhaps because of his situation being in exile in Babylon, uh, things like that, but he's definitely got some very interesting words that we don't see in other places of Scripture, they're very rare. So as we look still at this one, at this verse, we will see, if I can find it, the Esh, Tal T, Tal Nu, excuse me, if I can find it. Well, it's up there somewhere. It was there earlier. This idea of a, of a treetop or, um, yeah, top, top of a tree. The idea is that, um, as you see in the English, they use topmost. But the idea of being high up, very high up in the air at the very top. Um, then we also have the Haaretz. The Haaretz, well, I know, I'm having a hard time finding it. Hmm, two for two. The Haaretz has this, um, it's just really, a, it's extremely rare word, really. Um, and it really talks about, it. it's really this, it's the word for cedar, maybe. Our cedar, or here it is, Haaretz. 
the word for cedar. It could also be the word for fir, but the, the, the emphasis or the reference here is specifically to a very high, tall tree. Uh, maybe it's a cedar, maybe it's not, but it's way up there. That's kind of the, the idea. And that's, um, yeah, that's, there are even, um, if I can find this other one, we have one in here coming up. Yeah, this one I want to point out to you because this is the only place in Scripture we have it. It's a hop ox, as we say. This one here, the Watalul, that's um, probably, probably means lofty, uh, most likely from what we can tell from context and every, everything. Uh, again, it's the only place it's used in Scripture. Um, so that's our most common guess. It's high and uh, this idea of lofty, connected with the uh, mountain, har, Gaba, a mountain high and lofty. I have heard it translated by some, and certainly they're, they're trying to show a messianic idea here, I suppose, high and lifted up. That's a, a phrase that um, we're kind of familiar with. Now, as we're doing this, I want you to kind of cross-reference or look back also on chapter 17 here earlier in verses 3 and 4, you know, the subject is Yahweh and the elements are similar. Uh, also, you should make note again of those horticultural references back there as well. Uh, there's uh, the Vulgate's interesting here, and I don't usually read the Vulgate, but in this case, Hummel steered me in this direction, and it translates it like this. I will break off from the topmost of its branches, a tender one, and stretch it out and plant it on the most high and prominent mountain. It would seem from that translation that there's an allusion here to Jesus' arms being stretched out on the cross at the Mount of Calvary, and I uh, pretty well attested that that's what the Vulgate is, is doing there or pointing to. So they picked up on the Messianic character of this, obviously. So if we move on to verse 23, the maron, this idea of height again, notice that keeps coming up. The height, the loftiness, the high, uh, highest place, that kind of thing. Height, in this case, we have the, um, this, this, each one of them is a little specific in and of itself. This maron, is heights, but it's also it's the one that frequently used in the, the heights of heaven. So that's kind of interesting. It's used frequently, heights of heaven. Now this one is uh, in the mountain of the height of Israel, uh, where that will be planted, as we see. Okay, and um, because of its connection to that mountain, the mountain of Israel, uh, it seems to be a reference to redemptive work of God in Jerusalem, for instance, you know, on Mount Zion or Mount Calvary, either, I think, or maybe both and. Then we have the anaf, meaning twigs and branches. Oh, that's the usual, I think they translate it with boughs here. We might think more of twigs or branches. Uh, the idea, meaning mighty, magnificent, mad, majestic, perhaps, yeah. That's um, over here at the end of this first little part, the idea. Again, a little bit of an unusual word here. We have, of course, then uh, the words for bird. And this one's uh, tispor. The tispor is, it's not just birds necessarily, but really, um, oh, it could be any winged creature. Obviously, bird would be the first thing to come to mind. 
but that's, that's the idea of what's going on there. And as we also see there, Zippor, Zippor, Zippor. oh yeah, here's the, the word for bird, Zip, or the winged creatures, Zippor. Then also another uh, interesting old phrase, I guess we'll call it, the Betzel, the Betzel, Dali Yothai, meaning in the, the, the Betzel, in the, the shade or in the shadow, I think he used a shadow in this translation, the shade of the branches. Again, we haven't lost any of this, uh, all of these horticultural things, your cedar, your, your uh, twigs, uh, all of these various bits and pieces, boughs, the branches, et cetera, et cetera. And again, we'll continue it on as we get trees and high tree and low trees and green tree and dry tree, all this that's going to continue on into the last verse of our pericope. And I think this is safe to say, Hummel certainly mentions it, but this, uh, the reality of, of where Ezekiel is at in history, he must have been aware of these prophecies of Isaiah and probably perhaps of Jeremiah as well. Certainly he would have known of Isaiah. So this language that Isaiah uses, you know, the stump, the root, the sprout, things like that, he would have been very familiar with, these, with that as he, as he is being inspired to uh, pen these words. Okay, so as you look at this last verse then, note this very, and I mentioned this earlier, this, there's a string of hiffels here with this causative nature of the form. I want you to pay attention also here as we go through to this language of reversal. And we kind of pointed out as I was looking at these uh, various horticultural expressions, high to low, green, dry, you know, that kind of, that kind of language, uh, this switching, this reversal, the, and the, this is not uh, insignificant here. So pay attention then as we go through to these hiffels. And the first one here is our, uh, I think this is our first one, our hish palti. That's one hiffel. That one is from shafal. And it basically means to cause to be brought low, to make low, to lay low, uh, in the sense of causing something to be laid low. Then we have um, this one, the higbati. The higbati is um, this idea of uh, from the root gaba. Another hiffel, of course, cause to make high, to lift up, to exalt. I think we use that a lot. Or to, even if you want to keep the imagery here, to let grow tall. And then uh, we have another hiffel here, the hobashti. The hobashti. And the hobashti, this hiffel from Yavash meaning to cause to wither, you know, to dry up or to cause, uh, to make dry, sometimes uh, translate that way. And then our final one here, the wahi, the wahif rah, rah ti, the wahif rah ti. And then that's our last hiffel, our fourth one, I might add. Our fourth hithful in the verse, which is from parak, the root, and that means to, to cause to sprout, to cause to bud. So as you look through all of this then, some interesting language here. We'll just look at the English here. Shall know that I, the Lord, have. Okay. The causing agent here. 
As we said from the beginning, the causing agent here indicated by the Hiphel is God himself, the Lord God. So the causing agent of this great reversal, which, by the way, is a reference to the Messiah, uh, everything is changed. And we talk about the great reversal in Jesus Christ. We hear that language a lot as we, as we look at the Gospels, especially, you know, that he was lowly but exalted. You know, he was, he was dead but then alive. You know, all these different reversals, um, you know, the, um, well, we can go on and on about that. I mean, certainly there's, there's so many to discuss. But the idea is here in the words of our chapter, I, the Lord, have spoken and I will do it. His new, his new planting will keep those ancient messianic promises alive and then bring them to fruition. This is uh, the message here of this text. God bless your preaching.